Hello everyone, and welcome to the 10th episode of Dual Universe Explorers. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, um, or who are new here, uh, either watching on Twitch, YouTube, I guess Hitbox, StreamUp, I guess we're using quite a lot of services these days. Um, wherever you're watching, uh, welcome. Dual Universe Explorers is a, um, a fan group composed of people from the forums, from Twitter, Facebook, etc., who uh, all like the game so much, uh, they decided to come together and do nothing but talk about the game for an hour or two every weekend. Um, we talk about everything shared from uh, Nova Quark's social media pages like Twitter and Facebook to the AMA responses on their um, AMA thread on the forum. And uh, we basically just talk about you know, the mechanics in the game, we, we talk about what we'd like to see out of the game, we um, talk about our dreams in the game. Uh, of course, with all that being said, um, just want to make this reminder up front that uh, we are not affiliated affiliated with Nova Quark, we're not employees of Nova Quark, and we are not paid by Nova Quark. And with that out of the way, I will introduce our host for the evening, uh, Mastered Red. Mastered, how are you? I'm doing quite good. How about you, Yama? Uh, I'm doing all right. Tired. All right. So let us begin. I will introduce everyone. Darius, please introduce yourself. Hello and welcome to Dual Explorers. I'm Darius Sanguna, the founder and leader of the Terran Union. Guy, man. So, peeps, just hanging out. Talking, doing stuff. Trixine. Hey guys, uh, Trixine. Uh, how's everyone doing? Um, one of the co-founders of Ninja Clan Food. Glad to be on here again with you guys. Okay. So there is a lot of news this week. An absolute insane amount of news. So prepare to be watching for a long time. So. Dual Universe has reached 42,000 followers on Facebook. So, congratulations for them. And uh, they've also reached 7,000 followers on Twitter. This shows that the popularity is actually, actually increasing. Okay, so this week, uh, Nova Quark released a newsletter to all those who are subscribed to it. And so, it begins off saying here, that uh, there are more than 22,000 reading the newsletter, and that now they have announced that their crowdfunding campaign will launch on the 7th of September, here in just a couple of days. Don't... Don't sound so excited about it. So... Uh, uh, saying, uh, don't sound so excited about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait at all. Now, now, I asked for hints about Kickstarter, but I got no hints from from uh, <laughs> from my time at PAX about Kickstarter, other than Lame. you'll see on Wednesday. <laughs> yep. Lame. Yeah, but hey, we can fund it now. Yeah, it's not too far off, so it's only a few more days. Yeah, I'm excited uh, to see what the backing rewards are. Yeah. Yeah. Kickstarter. What else is new this week? What else has happened in Dual Universe? Hmm. Well, who would like to read the next point? on the newsletter. Don't don't all jump up. <laughs> all so, right, let's then. see. All right. So on the on the newsletter, um, we can just run through it because a lot of this stuff we're going to be covering uh, probably a lot tonight. Um, but Kickstarter, um, the 7th of September. Um, the newsletter also has a link which I suppose we should put in the uh, link in the description below the video. 
um, a link to support them on social media. They have like a social media campaign. Um, they're running on Thunderclap. Um, if you're not already subscribed to the newsletter, in which case you have this link. Um, they were yeah. at PAX this week. Uh, that was exciting. I just got back from PAX. You can tell he's a bit tired. A little bit. But uh, yeah. I think every, I think everybody at PAX was tired. Um, every, yeah, it's just certainly an exhausting event. Yep. And then next they had uh, well we covered this I'm pretty sure before but they have spaceship build, building gameplay footage released now. Yep. Yep. We'll uh, air some of that later on uh, here in a couple of minutes. Yep. And uh, then they have their tech demo for the massively multiplayer tech demo. Basically, the technology behind it. Pretty yeah, cool. We covered that last week. And then they'll uh, send a couple more newsletters here in not too long. So, can't wait for those. All right. So, we have that newsletter. Pretty. Interesting stuff there, although you'll find all of it very easy to find on the forums and uh, on their Twitter, so it's not that hard to dig up. But, uh, yeah, so I suppose I'll go on to the next point. We have an FAQ from the Dual Universe Facebook. Well, so before we get to that, we have to uh, actually play the video that the FAQ is about. Ah, yes. So, uh... Please do. All right. Uh, well, I guess I'll introduce the video. This this is the spaceship gameplay demo video that was released on uh, Dual Universe's YouTube. Um, ironically, this is the, the second time that this has happened. IGN published the video as well, but they compared the game to No Man's Sky. Um, we can grab about that after the video is done. Um, All we can say is we're not happy. <laughs> I don't think I don't think anybody's happy about it. Uh, but anyways, um, spaceship spaceship gameplay uh, video coming up, and let's cut over to that. Hi, this is Jesse from Novaquark. Welcome back to Dual Universe. This time we'll have a closer look at the building gameplay. More precisely, how to build the ship that you see in the E3 teaser, the one we see right now. This ship is only one example of what you can build. You can also create cities, orbital stations, anything. All this in a single shard sandbox, one single world shared by all players at the same time. Okay, so let's go now to build our first ship. As you can see, I'm on a planet and I'm about to deploy what we call a core unit, this blue thing in front of me. A core unit is like a starting point. Uh, when you want to build something, it's the first element that you deploy and it will create a local matrix, a local frame for your construct. It comes in different sizes that give you access to larger building zone, but this one I choose is the smallest with a 30 meter, uh, 32 meters building radius. So let's deploy it. The next thing to do is to deploy what we call shapes. Shapes are made from materials like uh, copper or the polymer that I have just selected that you deploy in your construct to create a structure. Behind the scene, it's using voxel technology, more precisely something called dual contouring, which allows you to really sculpt any shape you like. So we are not only talking about cubes here, even though it usually starts with that. Here, I've selected the large size cube pencil that I will use to drag a line to build a volume of polymer, as you can see. This is going to become the front of the ship. I can activate the grid view so you can see the underlying snapping matrix better. This is a 25 cm grid, as you can see, which is quite precise, but you can also select larger scale grid, uh, like this, or um, actually even larger. Uh, all these are visual feedback to help you build, and we plan on adding more of those to help you have a better sense of space. Uh, so now, let's carve out some part of this big box to start revealing the structure that will actually hold the cockpit. I'm selecting a cube pencil again and I'm going to use it in delete mode to select a volume to remove. And here we go. One important thing is that 
if you made a mistake uh, you can also use the undo feature uh, like this and get back to where you were before the last action uh, and it works also for really big mistakes that would be impossible to undo manually otherwise uh, like the removal of a sphere volume uh, as you can see uh, here so it works uh, pretty well for any situation uh, let's do just uh, now maybe just a, a little bit of final polish uh, to make this look better it's completely optional but uh, let's do this I'm moving a little bit of the front part and now let's select the cockpit the cockpit is an element we have already seen one element before the core unit but there are actually many uh, elements are active components of your construct they are given by the game design you can't modify their look uh, and they provide functionality to your construct like an engine a weapon a screen etc so uh, the cockpit that you see I can rotate position how I want remove it also uh, is a variant of a more general class of elements called control units uh, they are used to pilot your construct uh, but they can also host Lua scripts to orchestrate the other elements the cockpit is a bit special because it has an auto configure function that will be able to analyze your ship locate the engines and all necessary elements and create the flight control Lua script for you so no worry if you don't know how to script uh, you can still build and fly your ship I'm uh, finishing a bit of polish now, just uh, using this triangle uh, pencil and let's go now to the back of the ship to create the part that will hold the engines and the fuel tank. So like before, let's create a uh, volume like this and let's carve a hole in it to be able to hold uh, the fuel tank. Here we go. Let's cut it completely so we can see better. I'm going to pick uh, the tank now from uh, the inventory. Now, please remember that this is pre alpha footage. Uh, the UI is a placeholder and far from the final rendering. Anyway, so let's put uh, this inside here, like that. Uh, so different engines will need different fuel types. So this is just one example. Now you, You'll have to factor also the weight of the fuel tank when designing a ship and make trade-offs between autonomy and speed, for example. Uh, I'm going to close the space in front of the engine and for this, uh, let me show you the Surface Linker tool. It's a really powerful tool, uh, as you can see, that allows you to select two surfaces and fill the space between them with shapes. Uh, so it gives a lot of freedom in uh, the kind of things you can easily build with, uh, with the voxel tools. Looking good? Well, sort of. Uh, <laughs> Now, let me start to use the jetpack. Uh, that is a very important tool for builders as it allows you to look at your construction from above, uh, like here. Uh, I'm adding another bit of polish, as you can see, uh, using the line tool together with the triangle pencil uh, so that I can cover uh, the top part of the, of the ship. Uh, and now we are going to add a very important uh, element. You can see here the directional unit. Uh, this is basically telling where the front of the ship is, uh, which the auto configure uh, need to know. So let's put it here. Okay. So now let's add the last uh, and perhaps most important part, which are the engines. Uh, here you can see I can position one engine on this side. It will get automatically connected to the fuel tank because it's just next to it. Uh, we, we hope in the future to have some uh, connector units so you could actually uh, position the tank uh, anywhere you want and connect it uh, to, the, to the engine. But so far, so good. Uh, here we go. So we have the two engines connected to the fuel tank. And let me just add a, a last part, which is uh, these, these wings. Uh, they are called decorative elements. They, they don't serve any purpose. They're just here to to make the whole ship look good. You, you could do them with voxels as well, but uh, let's say, I mean, you have a choice. Uh, you have some pretty fine uh, decorative elements like that um, for your ship. Uh, okay, looks good. Um, maybe a last uh, uh, final touch is that I'm going to uh, uh, close this uh, opening here, uh, sort of to protect the core unit uh, from external uh, attacks. Uh, and here we are. Um, 
I'm going to add a, a last uh, touch that is that is pretty cool. Uh, I like it very much, uh, which is the fact that you can select a, a given color, like this red color here, and you are able to actually paint uh, using the paint tool uh, to paint the surface of your voxels uh, with that color. For example, here we are going to do some stripes. So we, we use again this uh, line tool to define the volume, and everything inside that volume is going to be painted uh, in red. So I'm going to do two stripes like that it's pretty easy and uh, uh, it immediately render I mean there's a little bit of uh, a black color here due to the lighting but there are actually two red stripes here uh, last thing I want to do is to add uh, adjusters so adjusters are, are those tiny elements which uh, actually are engines uh, but they don't require any power or any any uh, energy to be uh, functional they don't have a lot of thrust power but they are essential in getting your ship to be maneuverable because they are going to be used by the scripting and by the auto configure actually to create the forces to steer your ship uh, in any direction to make it turn basically so because everything is physically based you have to to put these kind of things so that you your ship actually can physically uh, do the kind of thing you expect it to do like turning going up and down and so on and that's it. I think we're we're pretty done now. We have a cockpit, engines, uh, a directional unit, adjusters. Uh, let me just remove the grid, and we're good. I'm going to use the jetpack again to have a final look around. It's a pretty nice ship. And uh, now the last thing I have to do is uh, simply to step inside the cockpit and activate it up on our way to the stars thanks a lot for watching i hope uh, you liked it um, keep in mind this this is uh, still pre-alpha gameplay a lot of things may change uh, until the final release uh, and meanwhile let's discuss together on our social media don't hesitate to join the forum cool well uh, I know you guys have a bit of a delay, but the uh, video's over. Okay. And, and I, I've seen the game. I saw the game at PAX this weekend, <laughs> and, and everything in the video is real. <laughs> yeah. Did you see anything extra that wasn't in the video? Um, did, you get yes. to, did you get to play it yourself? Yes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I should have just blown my paycheck and gone with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Yes, I mean, I didn't get to play like a lot of it. I got to, you know, walk around, whatever. Right. I I figured that PAX was more for people that like didn't know anything about the game, and it didn't feel right for me to just sit there for half an hour just playing the game on the one computer <laughs> they had it on. <laughs> but you so wanted to. Yeah. Now it was funny <laughs> watching some other people build on it, like um, because it was like you know God mode, and you could choose whatever you want uh, wanted from the inventory to build with and people were building like really funky looking things that didn't fly <laughs> uh, did, you, not, did you try making micro voxels um, no I, I didn't try building or anything really I just kind of looked around and then uh, I just asked JC um, to show me the uh, arc ship I wanted to see the arc ship I got to see the arc ship so. oh nice yeah. we're lucky and how much better it would have been if that was VR? It mm. it would have been awesome. It it also the arc ship looks exactly like the concept art, almost exactly. Do you it's see this inside of it? Um, I did not see the inside. I don't know if it if it was modeled, um, or not. But if you read if you read the lore, there's a part of the lore where they sit like a uh, Zohan. I guess is, is that what his name is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Zoh mm -hmm. Zohan Decker. Um, so anyways, um, there's a part in the story where he goes into the arc ship and then he's like on a ledge and he's like watching all the action going on below him. Uh, I got to see that ledge. Uh, <laughs> oh. They had like a model of a person up there. Um, it, was, it was cool. It was cool stuff. Um, hmm. And yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to give a whole lot away about it, but it was pretty sweet to see it 
Um, yeah. Other other than that, uh, PAX was exhausting. Um, <laughs> I woke up at 2 a.m. Uh, Central Time and got to PAX at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Time, <laughs> which was a long trip for me. Very. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, so let's let's talk about this video. What do you guys think <laughs> of this construction? I was very happy for one specific reason. Fuel types and engine types, possibly. That makes me extremely happy to hear. Though it doesn't seem as complicated as I was thinking it would be. I was thinking more of a space engineer's type building system than... Um... Well, not building system, but thruster type system, where you have to have thrusters in all the cardinal directions. Yeah, it's not it implemented yet. Ah, uh, so it will be there. So that that brings us to the FAQ section, and uh, hitting that point, um, I'll just throw it up on the screen. I'm not I'm not going to make you guys read the answers um, to this stuff. It's just a uh, yes. They, uh, it's, prob- it's just not implemented. <laughs> so, no, my, I mean, I, I saw the video and I was like, why didn't, why aren't there like vertical thrusters? I thought that it was all physics based. This but, not yeah. quite done yet. Yep, pretty much. But that makes it a lot more interesting because I don't want to have people who can just go into the game think they can build and all that. Yes, you're not. You're just not. You're going to have to take a long learning curve before you're even going to get close. Yeah. And, and I like do like the, the additional way. RCS thrusters, though. Those are pretty awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, what I was quite excited about was also the fuel types, but because there will probably fluid distribution systems also. Uh, with different fluids in them. Hmm. Yeah. It is official. I do want this. <laughs> <laughs> Build complexity over 9000. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it takes you two years to learn. So, give me it. <laughs> I want this. No, it's such uh, a pretty game. I mean, even even running on a laptop, it looked great. Like you could tell there was some. There's definitely some cleanup that has to be done. Uh, but the server and the client were all running on one machine, and it it looked great. <laughs> and also, he was moving much faster than you know a normal player would probably be moving. Like, I mean, he yeah, was in God, God mode, mode, like, f- all that. yeah, yeah. So I imagine that also played a part in it. He also showed you the spot where he would be looking down at all the players when they join in. <laughs> no, I think I think he and I think everybody at Nova Cork will be watching us. Just, <laughs> but we won't see them. But they'll be watching us do random stuff, talk about oh, them in yeah. chat. <laughs> hey, look at what those idiots are doing! And uh, right now you can't see it, but Tork is in chat. I am very sure that we will be torturing Twerk, and they will be laughing in agreement. Uh, Twerk Master. Because who doesn't like a good punching bag in a game? I can't wait to see his response once the stream catches up to him. Okay, yeah. But this makes me wonder, though, what will be the fuel types? Hmm. I mean, uh, we know the fuel types are used on Earth in our current ships, but there could be a lot more this implemented over time. Uh, in the videos, you can see on the tanks uh, an age, so I assume that means hydrogen. Um, Makes sense. Probably, probably we get also argon, argon for ion thrusters, uh, 
probably also our standard rocket thrusters like uh, we have today. Uh, antimatter could be possible. Hmm. It's definitely an interesting concept. And you know, we saw the engines there, and we saw the thrusters. However, we didn't see any power connectors to it yet. I imagine it probably isn't implemented exactly yet, but we can imagine that uh, there will need to be power systems all throughout, and maybe even some generators in some areas of the ship just to keep everything, you know, yeah, running smoothly. You talked about how they had the assets in the video for the wires, but they, uh, like in the in the video, because those rockets were so close to the fuel tank, you didn't need to connect them that way or something. Yeah, he mentioned that. And it definitely makes sense. Uh, it's interesting if it's going to be something like, a, you know, for some systems I'd like to see it connect into the actual you know, the wires have to directly connect, but it would be interesting if maybe like lights, the wires didn't have to directly connect with, you know, every single light. Maybe it would just be... But I so, don't know. So, last week, I think it was last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, but regardless, on a previous episode, I talked about building one of those dynamic core units, and, and I have one. Like, it's a two-scale model of one of those core units. Uh, and it glows blue because it has lights in it and everything. Um, <laughs> but uh, on on the topic of those core units, um, we know that they can get up to a certain size. And can you imagine... I, I guess I got in this conversation with JC and um, I figured it was worth sharing here. But in, instead of a um, like a large core unit that was pretty much that just looked exactly like that only you know expand it you know, 100 times or whatever what if a larger core unit for like a battleship was you know a different shape or something else entirely like just something massive that was part of your ship just like you know if it's a giant core unit for a giant ship it should look special hmm. maybe like, it, instead of that, like, it looked like a icosahedron, like a 20-sided die that just swirled or that'd something. Be, that'd be pretty cool. Or, you know, just go with a standard kind of reactor shape. It doesn't really matter. Be cool if it was big enough you could turn it into your bridge. Or <laughs> sphere. Yeah. That would be interesting. I would like to see that. Yeah, I, I think like it would just. Idea. Yeah, I mean, it it would flesh it out a little bit more than just having a giant cube. <laughs> like, I mean, if it was something that looked like it was part of a big ship rather than just a giant block. Yeah, that and would then, be quite interesting. It would kind of become a central, pivotal part of your ship too. Like, you know, you would build around it. It would become a room or something. Hmm. Everyone to the core room. Yeah, it kind of just makes sense. Yeah, I could definitely see that uh, happening. But yeah, that's basically it for the video. We don't have any more points, do we? Mm, uh, really. I, I just got another idea. Why not the core unit uh, texture like... Uh, computer and call it uh, computer mainframe or computer core instead of core unit. Not a bad idea. Hmm. I can definitely see it. Well, I think I think we'll just uh, skip to the good parts of this episode. Um, why, if <laughs> anybody's watching this, why they're actually watching this. Um, so thank you the for reason, <laughs> yeah, thank you for watching. Um, the, the real reason that I went to PAX is uh, to try to get a interview with uh, Novacork in some way. Like I had questions, and I was hoping maybe to get them answered, if, if even just hints or something. 
And I wasn't quite expecting the forthcoming responses that I got. Um, and I did one interview on Friday, but as it turns out that the audio quality came out pretty horrendous and it, I didn't want to share that audio here. So instead of that, um, JC yesterday, um, I, I went back to the convention center and I, and I went up to the booth and he was there and, um, reluctantly he, he agreed to, to do another interview with us. Uh, he was exhausted, um, quite right from, uh, PAX. Uh, and I mean, it was loud there on the floor and I mean, imagine everybody there is just yelling over the sound of everybody else the entire time. So, uh, anyways, uh, thank, thank you, JC, for agreeing to do this second interview, which is the one that we'll be airing. Uh, but for archival sake, we also have the first interview, which we will, uh, I suppose, share on our YouTube as well, or even the forums for those that really want to listen to it. Uh, yeah. Same questions are asked, only, um, you know, in the first interview, some of the answers may be a little more detailed as opposed to in the second interview, um, which uh, we got through quickly because, well, everybody was exhausted. And yeah, anyways, thank you, JC. And I guess I'll go ahead and start the second interview unless yes. anybody has some comments about it. Yeah, we made a mistake. And it's amazing that JC did this again. That's yeah. all I can really say. So... Thank you, and uh, here we go. Here's the uh, interview that I did yesterday with uh, JC of Nova Cork. Here we are, back again. <laughs> Our recording yesterday uh, didn't turn out so well. That was more my fault than anything. Um, and we're going to try this again to interview JC here from Nova Cork, who has been so gracious to sit down with me again um, and take the time to do this. Uh, thank you, JC. Hi there. Uh, well. Thank you for having me. Um, I will try to do my best after two days of non-stop talking. <laughs> my voice is almost broken, but let's let's uh, let's go. I'm, I'm really happy to answer your questions. And as I told you, uh, you know, I, I listen to all what you guys are doing on uh, DU Explorer. I really like it. Um, many many times, you know, I, I wish I could intervene and, and say something. So that I guess that's the moment where I can answer all your questions. So let's go. Okay, uh, my first question is about cargo containers and uh, space in markets. Uh, whether or not markets, uh, because when you said in another interview, if you bought a spaceship on another market, then maybe on another planet, you might have to go there and it would be waiting for you. And would that mean that markets in general have to have the space to actually hold the things that are being sold on that market? Yeah, that, that's the spirit. That's the idea. Uh, you know, we would like to have this, this giant structure uh, happening in a game, like giant space stations and so on. And uh, we thought, you know, if a market uh, can match, I mean, the size of the market can match the size of what you sell on it, you have this nice property that uh, a market that does selling a lot of things, in particular large ships, would have to have large hangars to hold those ships. So that's that's the logic of what we try to do, so that there's a justification for making super big uh, structures. Uh, there will be other justification, I suppose, but I mean, that's one of those. So markets are going to be realistic. And if you want to... A uh, small market, a small container will do, but if it gets more successful and you have more and more you know, goods to trade, then you would have to manage the growth of your market and, and organize these things, uh, invest into bigger containers if you want. Uh, I think this is a cool idea. Cool. Yeah, I really like the sound of that. Um, in regards to uh, flying to space, um, it was said that getting to space for a player, maybe who starts on day one when the game launches, may take weeks or months to get there. And my question is, is that more about the skills required to get there or you know, the resources, rare resources? I think it would be a, a bit of both. But uh, after some time, you know, the limited factor will be uh, the resources. You need to gather stuff. You need to craft all the different elements. Uh, many of those elements will, will require uh, other elements to be crafted prior. Like, for example, if you need an assembler or if you need a 3D printer, you need to do that first, right? So these are all level of industrial uh uh, infrastructure that needs to be there uh, before you can start to build the most advanced things in the game. We have not said you know, precisely exactly how this is going to be uh, organized. We have uh, 
started prototyping this actually, but we will try to make it so that you know building your first ship uh, and flying to space feels like a real achievement, something that is uh, rewarding. Uh, we we don't mind that it will take a bit of time. That will actually generate a lot of. Uh, Quests, if you want, in a game that you you now have to find this uh, rare resource that uh, and you have a, a goal that is to build this ship, you know. So I think it's okay uh, if it takes a lot of time, uh, as long as everything you have to do along the way is is uh, interesting, uh, it's fun, it's rewarding also. So that that's the vision how we envision. Now, of course, if you're doing the game after some time and there's already a big industry going on and so on, you can always go on the market and buy your ship. Well, if you have enough money and maybe. You will need to actually do other things before that so that you can get that money. So, you know, it's not like uh, it's going to be instantaneous. Cool. Thank you. Um, in regards to planets, um, when the game launches and people go out and they start digging holes in the ground, um, that, that may leave scars on the planet or, you know, the starting zone may look not pretty for new people coming into the game. Uh, so does Novacorp have any intentions of regenerating the planet or healing planets? Okay, that, that, that's a, a very important point. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, because we don't want, uh, we, I mean, we want resources to be scarce. scarce. So that uh, if somebody finds a uh, a source of some rare material that has a lot of value, you might actually get a lot of money out of that for time. And then somebody else can find also a, a resource later. And, you know, money is uh, changing hands because of that somehow. So we like this idea uh, that you don't have a perpetual uh, source of uh, wealth that will come from the fact that you think is always regenerating. It also gives a lot of uh, incentives for explorers or miners or scanners, people who are going to look for materials. So we, we plan to gamify this a lot. Now, that being said, uh, the fact that people, once they, they step out of the arc ship, we want uh, quite uh, legitimately, uh, want they, we want to uh, try their stuff, you know. Uh, we, we are aware of that. And uh, the thing is, uh, we, we want to, well, we think about, it's not clear we are going to do that, but we think about uh, having maybe, maybe a sort of simulation, within the simulation, which is a playground where you can actually test your tools and try it. Uh, before you actually go in the real game. Uh, so these are certain ideas. Maybe we will regenerate the area just around the arc ship, things like that. So we will see how this turns out, right? And also you have, you know, uh, territory management that will, uh, at some point where we have implemented that, it will allow people to decide who has the right to edit or not edit a certain area of the planet. So that's that's the set of ideas we have about this, this issue. Here we are back with the interview with JC. And the question was about um, what happens to players when they log out, I believe. All right, so the, the thing uh, is there's going to be like when you log out, your character is uh, disappearing with everything that he has in his uh, pockets. But uh, your constructs obviously will not disappear. Otherwise, you would have your know, larger castles that will suddenly uh, disappear. And that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, you will have also the possibility to build things into a safe zone, as you know, so it's not like they are going to be into any danger, or you will have ways to protect your things. Uh, possibly, if you're part of an organization, people can actually take care of defending your stuff. There will be things like, uh, at some point, we will develop things like uh, protection bubbles and things like that, right? Um, now, the other question is also if somebody permanently leaves the game, uh, this is a tricky one. We don't have the, the answer yet. Along the, the line of ideas we, we could develop at some point is, uh, when I say at some point, it means that it doesn't mean it's going to be in the final release. It might be in further expansions of the game. I want to make that clear, you know, because we're talking about the vision of the game and how we would handle things. It doesn't mean that, you know, that we develop all those things for the alpha, the beta, or even the first release. That's a very important point. So people don't get disappointed, for example, if it's not uh, immediately available. So that being said, uh, one thing we could imagine is a sort of a certificate of legacy or something like that that says what happens to your stuffs or to your uh, the rights that have been given to you uh, should you not show up after a certain amount of time. And this could be used as a requirement before you get any responsibility or serious job in, a, in an organization, for example, that people will request that you make it clear 
what happens if you don't show up after a certain amount of time? Uh, this, these, I think, are interesting ideas. But honestly, uh, it's a tricky question. It's a tricky thing. Nobody has had to deal with that uh, thing, with that scale, you know, where we have all these uh, huge constructions and so on that are physically there in the world, right? So I think the community... Uh, uh, we'll probably come up with ideas also. And as you know, we are listening uh, very carefully to everything you guys are saying. So uh, if you have uh, ideas about that, uh, let's discuss it and let's let's put them on the table, right? Okay. Um, the next question is about the camera view and the emphasis between first-person view and third-person view and how that might work in, in this ship, like how ship combat might look and how combat in general would look. Yeah. So the... The core experience you have is a first-person view, so when you step into a cockpit, you are in the cockpit, and so on. Uh, however, we we have in mind that the idea, we plan to have the possibility that you have things like camera drones that uh, will be tied to your uh, control unit, and when you activate it, then you actually, your eyes are moved to the camera drone, so you have a third-person view of your ship that will enable uh, more tactical uh, type of view uh, on the battleship, the, the battlefield. Uh, the, 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 the important thing is that we have to balance the, the rules of the game so that uh, it will be useful and important to have people uh, you know, acting in first person, either piloting small ships or uh, actively controlling turrets, for example, uh, in first person view, uh, as well as tacticians operating at, a certain, at, at another level, if you want. If we can have those two things that cooperate and that complement each other, uh, we have a win. We have something that, that works because then you have these two types of game. If you don't, if we don't put it out properly, uh, one might be much better than the other, and then uh, nobody will use the other type of you know fighting. So we have to think about that carefully, uh, making sure that everything has a function, uh, right? So. This, these are the ideas we have at the moment. It's not even implemented or anything. So again, let's discuss these things. I, I think there's room for a lot of uh, uh, you know cool things to, to develop. Um, in regards to combat as well, um, will we see weapons like uh, swords or flamethrowers or even exotic weapons? Not necessarily nuclear, but just exotic. Well, I don't think we're going to have swords because no, that's not the you know the, the backstory uh, doesn't fit with that. I think also swords, if you want to do it properly, you know you need more uh, like a FPS uh, style of accuracy, and as you know the. The trade-off we made with the server technology uh, is all about, you know, having a lock and fire approach on on combat uh, because we don't have the perfect accuracy, especially for things that are uh, a bit further away, which is fine when you have lock and fire. But if you want to do a proper sword fight, uh, you need the kind of uh, uh, accuracy that we we decided we would give up basically. So I, I think this is not our Focus is not the you know the the core value of the game, so it will be more like a, as I said, lock and fire. We could have a automatic lock for things that are close by, and we will have different types of weapons: close range, long range weapons. Uh, we will have different types of damages, specializations of weapons, and also protections on the armor and shield uh, side of things. So there will be uh, interesting balances to to do, uh, trade offs to make uh, with a sort of classical, you know, way of ending this kind of uh, parts of the game. So, no swords, I, I'm afraid. Um, in regards to land and territories, will you be able to rent land or perhaps rooms or even build something like a arena for people to have combat in, in your zone? Alright, so renting and all those things, it's, uh, it's an interesting point because, you know, uh, a territory is uh, controlled by a territory unit, which is an asset that uh, as an owner and like any other asset in the game it comes with a certain set of uh, uh, what we call powers so things that you can do with it and with every power you can actually decide who has the right to use it with the you know, rights and duty management system that we have explained in the dev blog and we, when this uh, rights and duty management system is uh, fully developed uh, again it might not be uh, at release time we will might stage these things but the idea is that you can give a right to use a certain asset uh, depending on the certain amount of money that is paid when it is used or 
every month or things like that, which is basically renting, right? And that applies to any asset, including territories. So there's nothing special about territories. Uh, they fall under the control of the RDMS. And we do, actually, we try to unify all those things so that you, you have only one system to understand, and then you can apply it to many situations. Uh, about the arena to fight, I mean, that, yeah, why not? You can make a construct that, that is dedicated to that, and you can have people fighting in it. I, I guess that's completely possible. Uh, lots of ideas are, you know, you could, you could condition the fact that you can enter this construct, this construct to the fact that you pay a certain amount, sort of like a ticket. I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe we could do that. You know, it could be fun. I don't know. Um, in regards to the infrastructure that you guys use, does NovaCork have a giant data center filled with computers, or are you guys renting from like a cloud provider, or what are the plans for that? Well, definitely, we we not uh, have any plans to have our own data center. Uh, you know, it's not the right thing to do. Uh, we're gonna use uh, existing cloud technologies for providers. Uh, we have not decided yet what provider, so uh, but it's gonna be the. Yeah, this way. No, no way. The data center is extremely expensive. We may come to that in a few years, uh, if that makes sense. But uh, no, no, we're going to rent stuff. And there are a lot of uh, different offers on the market that offers different properties. Um, you know, depending on the, how much you want the fast interconnections with your computers inside the cluster. We're going to build, uh, in effect, we are going to build a kind of supercomputer. Right, so we're gonna look at the different offers, and we're not gonna build it ourselves to start with. That, that's for sure. Oh, um, let's see. Are there plans for textures? Like, um, I know that we saw painting in, in the latest video that was released, but are there plans for maybe bump map textures to make it look like a rough surface, even? Uh, yeah, that, that could be possible. That you know, actually you you select the material that you will apply. Of a certain area to change the reflection that I mean the, the material properties. Uh, as you as you know, uh, we are we are using uh, uh, random techniques that allow these kind of things, uh, and so we, we we could get these kind of things. Yes, yes. Uh, we're thinking about also allowing organizations to have a logo that they can put on, you know, at some place on the ships, for example. Uh, the way it's going to be done is not uh, completely set, but that's the idea. And uh, it would be really cool that you can display your, uh, you know, your your personal logo on your ship. So this we could do probably yes. Okay. Um, is there a chance that we'll find a system with binary stars? Uh, it's unlikely, but. Uh, uh, it's definitely not the priority uh, because you know the stars are kind of real. So and the way the project light also is real. So this is an extra work for us to deal this with this issue uh, of uh, having dual shadows and things like that. So no, not not in the short short term. We'll, we'll keep it simple. Okay. Um, and my my final question here is uh, going to be about the inventory system. Um, is there a limit to how much people can carry? Um, and, and what does the inventory system kind of look like? Or what are the plans for that? Well, there will be a limit to how much you can carry, yes. But you have this uh, insane technology called the nanopack that allows you to transport a uh, huge amount of things, uh, like huge amounts of uh, rocks or you know copper or whatever. Uh, that would not make sense, you know, considering the weight that this represents. So let's say the nanoformer is compressing volume and weight. Uh, that allows you to carry a lot of things. We have in mind, you know, builders, uh, and we don't want, you know, people to have to come and go to a container to refill their pockets all the time. Uh, so. We want to make it possible to transport a fair amount of things, but not unlimited. So there is room for upgrades and a way to improve that with the skills and all sorts of ways. Uh, but it will not be unlimited, but it will be comfortable. It's not like it's going to be a pain all the time, especially if you're not into mining. You should be fine with your inventory. Right? Okay. Well, well, thank you. Um, that was my last question. Um, Thank you for sitting down again with me today and taking the time um, to do this. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And again, uh, we're all about exchanging with the community, uh, discussing ideas. Uh, I want to draw the line again between uh, what's going to be in the final release, uh, the first release, uh, probably at the end of 2018, uh, and what we're discussing freely like that, right? We don't want to go... Uh, 
it to feed your creep or you know people expecting too much things this is very important to stress uh, but at the same time we want to talk about the vision of the game you know where it could go uh, and, and then we select you know what gets into the first uh, iteration uh, but since it's an MMO and there are all these ideas about uh, uh, expansion that will come uh, perhaps every six months or so, uh, the idea is that features that do not make it for the first release will be staged for further expansions. And as time goes on, uh, we want to get closer and closer to the, the full vision that we are discussing, right? So we're going to try to have the set of features that make sense so that we have a fun game that exhibits the core ideas about the emergent gameplay. Uh, but it might not have everything we're talking about right now, right? I want to be very clear on that. So thank you, thank you very much, and uh, let's meet again, you know, on forums and you know, community platforms. Uh, be happy to answer questions. Uh, we we listen to everything you you do, guys, and we read everything you write. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. Well, that was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of information to absorb. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Yama, how about you start? Uh, so, uh, how about we just talk about how we feel about some of these things first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm super excited for... The, first, the most exciting question was the one I asked first, to me, uh, which was about cargo containers. Because uh, to me, that means that, like... Like he said, space stations, if you build a giant space station, there's a reason that you built a giant space station. It's not just because you wanted a giant space station. Like, you needed docks, you needed ports, like, bays to put your ships in, like, and, and the other thing is, like, it, I guess he talked about this in another question, but it was, like, um, it should feel rewarding when you do something. So, like, you know, when it comes to markets, like, there will be, there may be giant markets, or if there's a market where battleships are so sold, then it's going to be a giant, like, space station market of battleships. Like, there'll be a physical presence for the things in the universe. Mm-hmm. Yep, there'll actually be a purpose to having all of those storage containers. For, for me, it's uh, actually uh, made the, the next question for me. And is there a, a, different, a differentiation between physical and di digital goods? For example, you, you down digital, you can theoretically simply transmit via antennas. So could we have theoretically a digital market uh, like the internet? And but for this, we would also need infrastructure, uh, structure depending on the bandwidth and uh, the distance between the markets. Indeed. You know, the question that I actually found kind of interesting, and now that's answered, I can kind of adapt the point of view that you're going with. Will you leave a body when you log out, or uh, basically? What happens to your player character when you log out? I now see it, why they did this. Because if you think about it, this is an MMO. How many people do you think are going to uh, get the free trial, log into the game, go out a little ways, and then log out? I imagine it's going to be a massive amount, and so, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and so uh, you could eventually just get the fort of bodies around the art ship if uh, <laughs> if you uh, had that option that you know bodies would actually stay or they would uh, go into like a relaxed state. I think but we this just makes a lot them. more sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we would have just buried them in the pit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You just found the next in-game profession. Uh, <laughs> try, <laughs> try, play, 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 play uh, 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 garbage disposal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's why they didn't do it, I imagine. It's because doing it would cause actually a build-up rather than a, a bonus. Well, he and does talk about a problem. 
right? Yeah, I mean, he didn't talk about a problem necessarily, but it would definitely cause a problem eventually. Well, the I mean, the problem we talked about was the bigger issue is what happens when you log out or quit the game? What happens to all your yeah. stuff? Yeah. Like, but, does the ground, does everything just get littered with permanent landmarks that nobody ever comes back to, or um, they could, do they, they could implement, or? they could implement a, a thing like decay or a, a timer that counts down, and after that time has gone, so much time has gone by, people can start uh, tearing down their stuff. I yeah, like the yeah. idea of decay because that would mean, like, there's a cost to everything that you build. So, like, you build a big space station. It's not gonna. It's not gonna decay immediately because it's a giant space station. But after a while, like if it's not maintained, you know, it's gonna fall apart. Just like yeah, the international space imagine, station would fall apart. I imagine there's also uh, there's about there's a couple options here. One would be you could you know that contract that as he said basically if a certain X player was to go offline for too long then uh, it would hand their stuff over to someone else. That's a good idea. And then the DK feature after, after that. The other, only, the other option, which I don't think would be a good idea at all, is that after a certain time, ownership may cease. But that doesn't sound like a reasonable one at all. See, the reason uh, I like... The other possibility would be... Um... You you don't necessarily need to have the ownership of the core unit uh, to destroy the entity, and while you're destroying the entity, it could drop the resources. Mm -hmm. I like yeah, I like so decay because it reminds me of my favorite feature of Worm Online, which was the decay of like roads or constructions in general like you would come across ruins that were overgrown with stuff or whatever i mean it would take you know a year or two for it to get there if someone just abandoned something and didn't upkeep it but but everything had a, a certain quality level and if you didn't if you didn't maintain your stuff or like you know every so many months go and add some more bricks to your wall or whatever um things would fall apart or it started with roads mainly and roads would get overgrown and then eventually trees would grow back on top of your roads and whatever. Yeah. I mean, that definitely sounds like the best option, DK. And then, you know, the on top of that, the... Let's see, Ooh. on top of that... I'm DK, blanking here. linked to skills. Hmm. So, Pretty like, cool. someone with low skills may not necessarily... Like, someone who has low sk skills means that they haven't been playing the game for very long, so the chance of them quitting is <coughs> higher. You have to do more work to keep to upkeep buildings and everything? Yeah. I don't know. That's just an since idea. It, since, it's a, since it's a lower quality, I can see that working. That's actually a really good idea. Yeah, I could see that. Basically, you just uh, keep on upgrading your buildings... You know, increasing their level, and then once you log out, that's kind of what I'm hoping for from the skill set. It's like you first learn how to make a like a like a thruster, and it's got no extra like it, it doesn't look that great. It's all bare bones and really rough. And then like when you increase the skill to a certain point, it looks really sleek and nice. Yeah, I could imagine something like that. Although maybe that not the visual elements. That would give a opportunity for people too who have like higher skills at building certain things. Like, you know that the equipment you get from them is going to last longer too. That's another reason you go to them. That is right. a very good point. And depending <coughs> on the balancing of of the stuff, um, it could be also uh, worth it to rebuild a uh, early building instead of maintaining it. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. true. Well, yeah. or or efficiencies and items. Yeah, you'll I think see. This like, is definitely a good idea. Demolished. Yeah, this guy makes sense. So, what else was discussed in that in the in the uh, interview? 
there, there was one thing I wanted to talk about, and halfway through, I forgot what it was. I like that the uh, solution for third-person cameras is to give you drones. Oh, that was actually the one, I think, the drones. Because ah. one thing that popped in my head that I, I didn't mention um, when I was interviewing him was... Uh, if you were in combat and like ship combat, they may mean that one of your tactical advantages may be targeting the drones that are the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I unless they do it something like in Eve, where you can't actually see the drones; they're just kind of microscopic compared to your ship. Hmm. No, I want to be able to target drones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, I'm a silly. The hit chance on the drone will probably be pretty bad, depending on the size of the ship which uh, which you target you did the drone. Yeah, I wonder if drones will actually have a range to them. Maybe a range determined by skill level, perhaps. Yeah, but basically, Yama's way of sh saying, "I want to shoot stuff." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to force people to have to go into first person mode. Yeah, it's like, oh, sorry you didn't ever play the game in first person mode like the rest of us, but now you're blind. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. I imagine some people would prefer playing it in you know a third person perspective. That would actually be kind of an interesting thing. I wonder what would happen. I don't mind first person. I just, I'd, I'd like to have the option for third person when I'm in a vehicle. Yeah. Third person in a vehicle is much better. Yeah. That's where the drones come in. Right. Yeah. So what other topics were covered in that interview? Um... <clears throat> I did it and I still forgot. He uh, he talked about at the very end, um, you know, things being added to the game after release and getting further towards their image of what they want. Ah, yes, content kind of after. I kind of kind of had the thought that you know, what if someone makes like, say, someone goes to a planet and digs out a big dungeon, or they make some big, extremely detailed like city or castle. Kind of wondering if that could be like. If, if they could take that and make that an actual object that's added into the game that could be randomly generated as dungeons you could find on new planets. Nah, I don't see that happening. No. no. That's just my guess, based on whatever. Yeah, what they said. Yeah. I mean, maybe caves. That kind of goes back to the... Well, not completely back to the topic, but the other thing he brought up when I asked him about uh, planets regenerating over time. Um, yeah. And and in the interview that we lost, uh, the, uh, the answer was a bit more detailed in that, um, like, the zone around the arc ship may be regenerated. That may be something that they look at. Um, but they don't have a perfect answer for it. But they know that they're not going to go in and just, you know, regenerate planets because there's so many issues with, with doing that. Yep. Oh, and I know exactly where that rare ore is. Yeah, it's about it's about um, also ore distribution, right? You can't just keep re reintroducing new ore into it. Like, you... If a planet is exhausted of resources, you got to go somewhere and go get some. Yep, and that also makes it so that uh, there will have to be some cooperation for uh, to make sure that you know we don't exhaust all the plants resources pretty quickly. Uh, we... So, uh, where well, would be the point in have a procedural, uh, procedural generated universe if you just can stay on one planet and gather there there all the resources you need? Yeah, you'd never leave. <laughs> Now, but, if you, it's, you know. that's different than having people bring you those resources to your planet. That I totally get. Like, having people ship you stuff from other planets because you're still it still involves, you know, the whole universe um, and exploring and everything, even if you yourself don't want to go leave a planet. Yeah. We'll say, though, to me, that seems like it would help keep the economy stable. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. would. And that would also mean that uh, the person who finds another planet and scans it for, or maybe asteroids, if there are, I, can be them. He talked about this in the other interview, too, um, and I just now remembered this point. Um, in terms of the economy, um, when we were talking about NPC, or when it was mentioned about NPCs, market NPCs that would buy from players, what we imagined that meant was NPCs that you go up to and literally, like, you know, interact with and sell them stuff. But based on the information in the other interview, what I think that means is that there's going to be bots on the market that, that act like buying and selling agents that are indistinguishable oh. from real players. I see. That's interesting. Hmm. That's actually one of the more unique ideas I've ever heard. And that's how they seed the economy. And then over time, they remove the bots as the market becomes more active. So basically kind of like a crutch for the very beginning. I see. That's actually extremely clever. It's very, very useful. I like and it because it means like that. there's not like a... There's not, like, NPCs. Like, NPCs, like, you, we think about them. Like, we think about NPCs, like, you know, they look just like players. They're indistinguishable from players that way. But this is more NPCs if in terms, like, it's an invisible force that's going on. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And it would be useful for early game. But, uh, yeah, going back to the topic, uh, you know, market. It, basically, if people... It's possible that people, you know, decide to leave the planet early on in the game, you know, when we first get, discover flight. They find, you know, maybe another planet or asteroids or maybe even a moon. Scan it for resources. They basically have a market advantage as well. So it encourages competition for exploration and discovery as well. Basically, everyone wants all the ore. That's going to be one of my main missions, is finding that ore. Indeed. One of my missions yes. is going to be finding that ore, and then sending it off into space. <laughs> <laughs> so that nobody can have it. No, Dang. this is mine. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple hours later, sending the first crew off into, on that very same path. Of your, yeah. uh, <laughs> we've got some sure. plans on how to do that with some people. <laughs> ah, frightening. But yeah, I mean, it definitely would make sense uh, to basically have that invisible force, as was mentioned, and I definitely think it's unique. But I think we'll probably be able to tell. Which ones are the bots after analyzing their behavior for a while? Maybe. Well, depends. I mean, like, if we're talking like a, a market bot on like a Bitcoin market, it's pretty easy to tell who's a bot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if we're talking about bots in a dual universe market, I suppose the bots will be immediate. Yeah, the ver the, the, those of us who are in the game, yeah, um, on at launch and have the first market stalls, will will realize who the bots are. But the thing is, the bots might not actually represent themselves as players on the market. It might look like Eve, like when someone when someone buys something on the market in Eve, unless you're the seller, you don't know who bought it from you. Hmm. You just see Maybe. it like disappear off the market. Also, if uh, we put something up instantly and says crap, we'll know. Yeah. And I, no. I figure after a while, they'll probably despawn the bots. I mean, they're not going to be there for very long. Oh, of course. That's what they yeah. said. Yeah, only long enough for us to uh, see the market. Only, only so long up. enough to see the market. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they stay for the most basic resources like stone and wood, 
for the newbies to uh, get some cash, but uh, not not for uh, rarer resources like uh, or more important resources like iron and aluminum and but, stuff. But that's the thing. That's the thing. If you if you made it do that, then that would kind of mean that as a new player, you're expected to have to go out and get those resources like wood and stone and everything. But that would kind of negate the whole evolving experience of the game for new players. Whereas the way and, that I thought it would work is like as a new player, maybe a year or two into the game, you're not concerned about going and collecting wood and stone. You're concerned about going and getting a job as a new player. Yeah. And then not to mention that someone's always going to want wood and stone. I and, mean, and that kind of solves it. it. That kind of is a solution in itself too, because um, if if a year or two into the game, people are coming into the game, and instead of going out and trying to mine resources to sell them immediately to get money, if instead of doing that, they're going and getting jobs, then it has solved the problem because now players have taken over the issue of how to see you know the market or how to pay new players and how to get them into the economy. Yeah. Yeah, but a uh, problem is probably that how get you more currency on the market? Um, in the beginning, you might have 1,000 players, and you have then you are 1 billion currency, and that is enough for that 1,000. But then two years later, we have 100,000 players, and the 1 billion currency is not enough anymore. Uh, let me introduce you to the concept of a deflationary currency. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Bitcoin? Well, duh. It's called the buying power. I mean, it's in, in Bitcoin, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. So what happens when there's more than 21 million people in Bitcoin? Like, it's kind of the same problem there, right? And the way that it works out is that the value of the coin goes up and down to adjust for how many people are on the market or who are using the currency. So if, if more people come into the game, then perhaps the currency's value may rise because less will buy more. Mm hmm Yep, I remember uh, the first forum post you made was literally a, I don't know how many paragraph long forum post about cryptocurrency and how it could be implemented into dual universe kind of that, that was how you started off on the forums <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's like the difference between an Austrian economics point of view and a Keynesian economics point of view it's a you know should you let the market just dictate the value of everything, or should you try to artificially control it by introducing more money into the system uh, that's not backed by anything? Then it becomes like this market management nightmare. <laughs> or economic management nightmare. I mean, there's a number of ways they can do it. I think that it makes more sense for them financially to let the market decide how to, how to handle all of that than to hire some economics planner to come work at Dual Universe or Nova Corp to manage the dual <laughs> universe's economy. Hey, well, uh, they already got one. And they could probably snag you up pretty quickly, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> they, had a, they had a guy working for uh, EVE Online for a couple of years there. He doesn't work there anymore, but uh, he, was, he wasn't really an economics planner so much as a guy that just studied the economics of EVE. Yeah. Mm. He he, uh, he helped control the markets whenever the game first launched. So I I imagine Novacorp might do something like that, just to get the market started. Again, simple solution: snatch up Yama. I mean, he wrote, I think it was ten paragraphs on how cryptocurrency would be a good idea. That sounds like a lot of work. I'd rather <laughs> just. Uh... Watch, watch, play the game. <laughs> yeah. Cool. You know how they um, say if you start to work on a project, you start to hate it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I get the point with the rising of the value, but um, 
I just want to point out uh, uh, the aesthetics of the system. It's kind it's to exaggerate that a bit. It's kind of ridiculous if you somewhere when get a capital chip for one currency. So Bitcoin right now, um, taking this back to Bitcoin, Bitcoin right now is worth six hundred dollars a Bitcoin, and at a period of time they were worth what? pennies someone bought it someone bought a pizza for 10,000 bitcoin <laughs> so that's how deflationary currency works yep i'm sure they'll figure something out we shouldn't have to worry about it too terribly much yeah not so concerned about the money aspect because I mean, Alpha's going to launch, and I don't think there's going to be a market when Alpha launches. Probably no. not. We're just going to be building stuff and trying to break the game as much as possible. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, who doesn't enjoy that? Speaking exactly. of Alpha, who is excited about Kickstarter? Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, I cannot wait. Yeah, it's the day before I get paid. <laughs> now, why can't you make that reaction when I was saying it? <laughs> hey, Kickstarter. When I see the Kickstarter, I will probably cry because I don't have enough money. Well, I don't think they're going to have it too expensive to where you can't buy into it for relatively cheap. No, and I wish I had some details to give you, but I have uh, zero. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Tune in and... next Saturday. Yes, we will know exactly what's going on then. No, I, I asked them to. Of course, they don't. They're not going to come in until tomorrow. But I asked them to uh, let me know what time exactly the Kickstarter was going live. Like, is it going live midnight France time, midnight U.S. time, sometime in the middle of the day? Like, is it going to be unpredictable, like the community site time was? <laughs> I absolutely hated that. Just have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Some, well, some guy sitting there with a big red button, and then he suddenly says, "Oh no, I feel like it," and presses it. That's what it felt like with the community site. There were a ton of people at PAX that came up that were super excited about it, but then when they heard it was, you know, not launched yet, or they they were like, "Can I download it? Can I get it now?" Like, and they just kind of write it off. So I think that there's a lot of people that are just going to, like... Um, oh, oh, that... Oh. Oh. I, Shit, I yeah, have to wait. They're just going <laughs> to wait. And and when the game actually does come out, and when they see footage from, like, Alpha, or they see the game is actually something that they can go purchase and play, regardless of the state it's in, then they'll jump into it. Um, oh, yeah. And it'll be, like, this pivotal moment. It's just, like, this... this point right before the game go even goes into kickstarter that's like this murky water because they're making huge claims and people you know rightfully don't have any reason to believe them very scared yeah i mean people have made these claims for a very long time it's just that nobody's ever put this much uh yeah i mean we've never seen you know tech demos this like this We've never seen tech demos that actually work, period. <laughs> With, you know, a thousand nodes running, a thousand PCs running. Yeah. And, you know, I'm taking a look at some of the older projects, and we all remember Star Citizen, the Kickstarter for that. I'm yes. just uh, taking a look at that. It raised quite a bit of money. I think like ninety million dollars or something. One hundred and eleven, one hundred and twelve or something. Good lord. Yeah. <laughs> it made enough to keep the project going, but eh, still needs a bit more work. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, let's Anyways. see here. Yep. 
I don't know. There's just so much, so much information that came out this week, and uh, I'm exhausted. A, so that's not helping. <laughs> um, but uh, it's too bad you guys couldn't have joined joined me at PAX because it was super fun. <laughs> My identity stays a secret. Oh, um, did I know we've probably discussed this, and I think the answer was no. But did you find out for certain if they're going to be coming to PAX South? They're not, right? Because that's yeah. whenever they're gonna planning on launching the alpha. That is, uh, they didn't tell me any of that, but I thought that was on the forum, or they said that on Twitter. I thought that, uh, yeah, it was on Twitter that they probably weren't gonna make Pack South, or it was questionable since they were going to be preparing for alpha, but they didn't say when alpha was launching. My guess is that alpha is launching in February of twenty seventeen. Because Much PAX closer. South is like the weekend before February or the first weekend of February. It's January 17th, I think, through the 18th. Okay, yeah, so that's what leads me to believe that it's launching in February. Yeah. <coughs> I hope they can come to PAX South. That would be amazing. I mean, PAX South alpha release i know yeah. which one i want more oh yeah <laughs> yeah if it interferes with anything then no no please just give us alpha we've been waiting for the longest time i like that um you know they're they're more focused on making the core game work than they are adding all these features all at once so they're looking at this model where, like, every six months there's an expansion that adds more. Kind of like the EVE Online model. Now, he didn't say free, but I'm assuming free. Like, a free expansion model like EVE. We can hope so. I mean, you pay the subscription, and that pays for the expansion. I mean, even if it was a buck, maybe, per expansion, I would definitely consider that. Well, the expansions would be things that would be so... Im I mean, they would be have to be applied across the board because they'd be game-impacting expansions. <laughs> and expansions would be things that add, like, skills or new mechanics to the game. Um, I don't know. I'm just expecting them to be free if they're following the EVE Online model. Yeah. I, I don't foresee them being after a whole lot of cash. I mean, I see them running a business but i don't see them that money hungry i yeah. see us probably not getting multi-crew ships immediately but i also see it not really being an issue because we're not going to be in space for a while anyways yeah i could definitely see that actually like, uh the eve expansion model i call it that way it's kind of sneaky because it's actually not a expansion model it's just they call the big updates expansions and that is it basically <laughs> they tell you okay you get expansion normally you will pay for them like ten dollars or fifteen dollars here you get it for free but it's just a big update <laughs> right well What's the that's difference? all an expansion is is just a large update anyway so yeah i suppose so but that is a little bit sneaky a little bit anyways but then again um well, uh, do you guys have any like major topics you guys want to cover tonight? Or uh, I thought we were going to make this a two-hour show, but I guess uh, we just kind of snuck through all that stuff real quickly. Yeah. There yeah. hasn't been a whole lot of new stuff on the forums, and it seems to have slowed down quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting a big burst of news after PAX. Um, oh, yeah, especially with the Kickstarter. Yeah, I'm t thinking like Tuesday, Wednesday, you'll see a bunch of big news. Probably Tuesday. Yeah, probably. Actually, uh, considering Monday's I, a holiday. 
actually I have a topic and that is also the renting uh, system. Uh, the, uh, the, I gave you the question for JC, uh, but the problem where there my question was not uh, not exactly that uh, question uh, how I wanted it to be questioned. Um, my question was um, about can we pa uh, partitionate uh, territory tiles and grant this partition separately? and not uh, can we rent uh, out a uh, whole territory tile because that was more or less clear. Hmm. You probably could. I, I don't really see any restrictions on how or what you can rent as long as you own it. Yeah, yeah you can just use the RDS system along with it. And then you could also build constructs like large buildings for people to build in or plot out pieces of land with those constructs and give permissions inside of the constructs to those people. The only thing that would be a little bit difficult I could possibly see with the renting system is uh, basically you could rent, yeah, but making it so that you're trusted in the renting community might be a little bit more difficult. You could sell foundations, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Um, I sp spoke with Crook Motor about the topic and he actually, he had a sneak peek in the Uni engine and he told me a bit about it and he said, we basically, um, you own the territory unit and you can begin to place core units, um, set via Lua the boundaries and then uh, rent them the, the core units out and should someone want to build an apartment building and uh, to rent out the apartment separately he would come to you and uh, ask if you could place again um, core units and set them to the apartments and so that he can rent out uh, the apartment separately yeah, was, <clears throat> part of what you said was going to be my one of my questions was uh can you set a boundary of how far from a core unit someone can build? Because if you can, then exactly what you said, you can place it and rent it out to people. Anywho. <laughs> Anywho, I'm exhausted. I've been now on... <laughs> I haven't, I haven't yeah. been asleep been to sleep in a long time yeah and don't worry Yama <laughs> to help share the pain I didn't get any sleep last night either <laughs> yeah I know both of y'all were up all night trying to figure out um the uh oh what is it the that audio file for the interviews yeah I gave I was, up on that after a while <laughs> I was on a plane with surrounded by screaming children the whole time <laughs> for both plane trips no i mean i went to a pax party last night left the pax party went directly to the airport from the party and yeah it wasn't really a big party either it was more like a bar where there were people playing board games the official pax parties were kind of uh empty at least the ones i went to last night was going to the wrong ones, apparently. <laughs> apparently so. Or I was just comparing it to the Twitch PAX party, which was awesome. Everyone should become a Twitch partner. We all had the same hesitation to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was an open bar. Open bar. Free entry, free video games. But you're not a pack. But you're not a Twitch partner. So yeah, I am. Are you? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Pretty sure Twitch he has multiple. Last year. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he has also other Twitch channels besides Zero sure. Explorers. Well, I knew that. I just didn't know that he was a Twitch Twitch partner. Yeah. Apparently, all you have to do is ask, <laughs> <laughs> and they make you a partner. <laughs> 
Yama has figured out pretty much everything. I can tell. How to get an interview, how to get a Twitch partnership, how to get a second interview. Oh, I saw I saw the uh, the Discord guys at PAX, and uh, I saw their booth, and I was I saw their advertising t Discord partnership. Like, what does Discord partnership get you? And then they told me, and it was like, yeah, we'll give you access to like you get your own private Discord server, and we'll give you your own custom URL, and we'll give you your own audio codex, and it's like, okay. Like, uh, <laughs> all the stuff that's already free, anyways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll give you all of this. You know, it's the same thing you already have, but just we say. So what it you're is saying is, you want to brand our Discord and then make money from us somehow? You want us <laughs> to advertise you? <laughs> uh. Okay, then. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Oh, you also saw the guys at a Beam, correct? I didn't see them. Ah. They were there, but... I saw the guys at Game Show. Game Show is the software we used to use for hosting this show. Um, used to be, I say that... <laughs> Because they lack the feature to actually stream to your own, your own. If I wanted to stream for a game show to restream.io, I couldn't do it because you can't customize where you're streaming to. You can only choose between Twitch or Hitbox, and I think YouTube maybe. <laughs> and the other thing is that they totally like shrugged me off when I was there. They like. A weren't they were ignoring me completely, and I kind of like just had to like butt into a conversation because I wanted a shirt. And they were, they were trying to like explain game show to me, and I was like, oh no no, I already own game show. And then and then after a suit as those words left my mouth, they were just like, oh okay, like as if I was no longer a priority to them. Like I gave you money, <laughs> just give me a shirt. Come on. <laughs> Rude. Much? Just listen to me. Uh, yeah, it's sad. That's quite a few developers nowadays. It is. Yeah. Well, I got some fun Twitch, or some fun pack stories I could tell offline. Stuff I don't want recorded. <laughs> 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 what happens it's... at packs stays at packs. Yep. Except for the exhaustion. That just keeps on going with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised we got through all of that so quickly. It well, felt like it was um, easily going to be four hours. I mean, two hours. I think that um, if there's anything that I got out of PAX from doing all doing both of those interviews, um, it's that a they're listening to everything that we're saying um, on the forums and on Twitter and uh, social media. We're being so the watched. reading and, and watching us, apparently, um, which is awesome of them. Um, and two, or B, I guess B, is that they, uh, they're they telling us, they pretty much have been telling us things that they want, that they would like us to help. I don't know if that, I don't know if I'm wording this right. It's like they're giving us hints on things that they feel like we could make a great input on or big input on like when they were talking about the orbital mechanics several times have i seen it mentioned they don't know the best way of handling like they want they want a planet to be able to orbit a star but they don't know what to do if there's a ship in the way of that orbit so so i think like topics like that are things that should be brought up in the forums like how should we address this mechanic because like we want orbital mechanics how do we solve this problem like, they're telling us problems that they're running into or, like, things that they haven't necessarily figured out. Um, and I'd like to see more of those conversations happening on the forum than uh, I don't want this game to be pay-to-play. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yep. Once a week. <laughs> Once a week. <laughs> every yeah, single every freaking time. time. Oh, gosh. Just let it die already. Just let it die. 
never. All right, there. <laughs> well, I suppose, assuming no one has any more thoughts. No, we were about an hour and a half in. It's a good time to wrap up. Yep. Surprisingly short for PAX. <laughs> I have a little idea regarding this. We probably forgot the half of the interview after we uh, addressed the first topic and because of that we went so fast through all of this. Yeah. Oh well. If there was anything well, we missed, we'll just cover it next episode. And I'll take the interview and I'll cut it into its own video and upload that uh, to YouTube as well um, as its own segment. Yeah, that would work better. Alrighty then. Well then, Darius, would you care to sign off? Of course. Darius Sanguinenatus, uh, signing off. Guyman? Gaiman, signing off. Catch you all next week. Dragzine? Oh, it's Trixine uh, heading out. Uh, thanks for having me again, guys. It's a blast. I'll catch you guys next time. And I am Master Red, leader of DOA and current host of this show. You know, because Yama, for some reason, likes me to be the host. See y'all next time. Cool. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Thank you, uh... For watching Dual Universe Explorers, we'll be back next week on Saturday at 4 p.m. Central, Standard Time. And be nice to each other. <laughs>